Hello and welcome to a Bible study. From my home to your home, this is Robert Holler, thanking you for taking the time to observe this teaching video. Hopefully to learn something from Scripture and God's truth and share it with the world. Today we're going to look at the book of Romans. We're going to look at Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. The mystery revealed. Now these three chapters have been a lot of times by scholars and biblical teachers and preachers and alike referred to them as the parasynthetical chapters in the book of Romans. Romans consists of 16 chapters. And a lot of times it's been referred to as the common sense doctrine for the body of Christ. Found in the teachings of Paul under the revelation of the mystery. <clears throat> you can read, starting in chapter 1 and verse 1 of Romans, and read quite consistently on through chapter 8. And it goes with a rather common theme and flow of things. And then, something happens in chapters 9, 10, and 11. Paul switches gears, so to speak, and brings in something that is not consistent with the first eight chapters of Romans. And you will find it's not consistent with chapters 12 through 16. If you take and read the book of Romans, and I just challenge you to try this, Read chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, 7, and 8, and skip 9, 10, and 11. Go right to chapter 12 and read on through verse 16. You will find a very nice flow to the book of Romans. Why are the chapters 9, 10, and 11 different? It has to deal with a lot of different aspects, but it it's a little bit of a mystery of why Paul or why Jesus Christ had Paul write through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost to bring in these three chapters that really don't fit the general theme of the book of Romans, the common sense doctrine for the body of Christ. Well, we're going to look at that from Scripture today. And it's very important to understand something called the mystery or the revelation of the mystery of Jesus Christ. These verses or these three chapters, the reason they're referred to as parasynthetical is they are in parentheses per se in within the realm of the book of Romans from chapter 1 through 16. There looks like a little division going on there. And division is not something new from Jesus Christ. Um, in fact, he commands us in first, Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, he says to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we can learn something from Jesus Christ's earthly ministry on this from a verse that he said during his gospel of the kingdom message to the nation of Israel. And you can find that in the book of Luke, Chapter 12, verse 51. Now this is what he says. Jesus is talking. He says, Suppose ye that I come to give peace on earth? I tell you, nay, but rather division. Now division is probably misunderstood by a lot of people, or they don't understand or pursue the knowledge of what he means by division. I mean, you can read the Gospels of Mark, Mac, Matthew, Luke, and John, and Jesus Christ did come not bringing peace but a sword and to cause division. It's amazing how the people of this world today, teachers, preachers, theologians, preach on the peace of Jesus Christ when they preach and teach from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But anyway, getting back to the division that he's caused, there is something that is in Romans, 
that is hidden, but there to be revealed. Sometimes if you want to hide something, the best place to hide it is in plain sight. And we're going to look at that today. We're going to look at the chapters 9, 10, and 11 in kind of a brief synopsis here to give you an understanding from a biblical perspective why these are here and what they really represent. Now, to continue on with his statement in verse 51 of Luke chapter 12, something happened at the cross. And I taught on this previously in a video. The great division, the cross itself created. Because if you read from the Revelation of the Mystery, you'll find in the book of Ephesians, something very interesting in chapter 2, and verses 9, I believe it's 7, verse 11, and verse 15. Excuse me, 13. Verse 7 says, in the ages to come. So we know there's ages to come. Verse 11 says, in times past. So we know there's times past, and there's an ages to come. Verse 13 says, but now. The three divisions of the cross, the times past, before the cross, the but now of the cross, the body of Christ, the age of grace that we are in, the revelation of the mystery from Romans to Philemon. And then you have the ages to come, the great tribulation, the millennial rule, the thousand years of Jesus Christ and the second coming ushered on into eternity. That's the three major divisions of the cross following up to what Jesus Christ taught in his earthly ministry, where he said, I come not for peace, but actually division. And he's going to do it with a sword. So with that in mind, let's look at this division in the book of Romans. Chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to find something very unique about this. I read Romans many, 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 many times. And I've studied Romans many, many, many times, never seeing the mystery that was revealed as it has been now. Like I said, sometimes the best way to hide something is to hide it in plain sight. Now, if you take the divisions of the cross that are in the revelation of the mystery that is explained in Ephesians, where you have times past, ages to come, and the but now of the cross. And where is it found? It is found in the writings of Paul in the revelation of the mystery of Jesus Christ that he gave to Paul to give to you and me, the doctrine for the body of Christ from Romans 2, Philemon. What do we find in Romans, the first book of the doctrine for the body of Christ? We find something in verse in chapters 9, 10, and 11. You're going to find chapter 9 deals primarily with the nation of Israel in times past. Just bringing into remembrance here the flow of Romans from chapter 1 through 8 and all of a sudden it's something else there. He brings in, Paul, the times past of Israel. Romans chapter 9, it deals with he talks about the adoption of the Israelites from God, the glory they have received of God, the covenants that they have received of God, the giving and serving of the law which they received from God, the service to God and of God as they have received, and all the promises of God they have received and the works thereof. All of these things, when you look at it, rightly dividing the word of truth, these things he's talking about in chapter 9 is about the nation of Israel in the times past. Okay? Before the cross. Romans was written after the cross. But he's giving us, again, for our learning, there is something going on that they went on in the the body of Christ, when the cross came into effect. And he's showing it in more than just one place, not only in Ephesians and in 13 books, but he's going to show it in the book of Romans by telling you in verse 9 are things in the past, and it had to do with works. Now you come, and we'll look at those, 
as I give these to you, you're going to look at chapter 10. All of a sudden, chapter 10 talks about something called faith. Within the same realm, jumping from works in the times past, he's talking about the but now of the cross. All of a sudden, things are by faith. Because if you read chapter 9 and try to bring it right into chapter 10, it doesn't make any sense because he's talking about things in the times past that was under the law, under the works, and all the promises of God. And then he comes into chapter 10 talking about faith. No works. Just by confessing. Which was not mentioned in verse 9 whatsoever. So chapter 10 is in the but now of the cross. The age of grace, the gospel of the grace of God. The body of Christ doctrine that we are in today. This age of grace. By faith and faith alone. And then you get into chapter 11. And what do you see? You'll see primarily Paul talking about the restoration of Israel. Now, where do we find out about the restoration of Israel? Most of the time we read about that coming in the ages to come, in the book of Revelation, in a lot of prophecy about the restoring of, of Israel, where Jesus even said, when Peter asked him, hey, what's in it for us 12 that gave up everything to follow you? And he says, in the time of the restoration, when the Son of Man will sit on his throne, he, 12 shall sit on throne, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's chapter 19 of uh, Matthew. Very interesting. Chapter 11 talks about the restoration of Israel. It talks about turning Jacob from ungodliness, taking away their sins. Out of Zion, a deliverer will come. Now, this is not stuff that is part of the Roman theology of the doctrine for the body of Christ from Romans 1 through 8 and 12 through 16. It doesn't fit there, but it's in the book of Romans. Why? To show the division, to show once again what the cross had accomplished. When Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross, he died for our sins on the cross. He was buried. His death, burial, and resurrection of the cross changed everything. And it was just to show you, to remind you, you're in the doctrine for the body of Christ, however, not to forget what Israel went through and what they're going to go through. Because all of Scripture is for our learning, but not all of Scripture is to us. But you can plainly see, if you look at the three divisions of the cross by rightly dividing the word of truth as God commands us to, you will start to see why verses 9, 10, and 11 really don't fit the central theme of Romans, yet it's there in plain sight, and it was not a mistake that it was put in the book of Romans to continue on from chapter 8 to chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, and then back into chapter 12. It was a little bit of an interruption of what he was giving in the first eight chapters and what he continued with in the next four, from 12 to 16. Now, I'm going to show you the graph of what I was talking about, and you can take a look at it. You can pause your video and write it down if you wish. But you can see the divisions of the cross of the times past. That was before the cross, before Jesus Christ's crucifixion. In the middle, up on top in the square box, you have the but now, dealing with faith. And then on the next one, you have the ages to come in that box. The restoration of Israel, turning Jacob away from his ungodliness, and so forth, and so on. But you can see how the 9, 10, and 11 chapters of Romans fit very well together to reveal the mystery, the revelation of the mystery of Jesus Christ in times past. There was Jew and Gentile in the but now, which the book of Romans is being written in, there's no difference. It's Jew or Gentile. Neither Greek, it's neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, neither male or female. We're all one in Christ Jesus when it comes to salvation. And you look at chapter 11. It's by the ages to come, the restoration of Israel. How unique to put that in there, not to throw people off, not to confuse people, 
but to reiterate why it is so important to rightly divide the word of truth, because it all fits, even though they're in a parenthesis, so to speak, within the flow of the Book of Romans, you can see why it was not a mistake that it was put into there, because of what was written and what was being taught in the chapters of Book of Romans 9, 10, and 11. Because you have to agree, if you read the Book of Romans, it really changes gears and talks about something totally different. Because he talks about in Romans chapter 9, verse 1, he says, Paul says, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. That I, verse 2, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrows in my heart. <coughs> Excuse me, verse 3, for I could wish that myself were accursed of Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. And here is the great promises. Verse 4. Who are Israelites? This is Israel he's talking about. Not the body of Christ all of a sudden. Which the whole book of Romans predominantly central theme is too. The body of Christ. However, he says in verse 4, Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? These promises were given to the fathers of Israel. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob has nothing to do with the body of Christ, does it? But it's in here. And it says in verse 5, Who are the fathers, and of whom are concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God, blessed be ever, forever. Amen. And he talks about the history a little bit of Israel when he talks about he mentions Esau. He mentions Jacob. Now, wait a minute. These are people of times past. These are people of the Old Testament. Before the cross. What are they doing after the cross? As a general reminder, for our learning. Not for our doctrine. But for our learning. Very important to understand that. Because he even talks about the potter and the clay. Now, the potter and the clay, you can read about in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and the old prophets of the Old Testament. Ezekiel, it talks a lot about the potter forming of the clay. Because he says in verse 20 of chapter 9 of Romans, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? So the thing formed, say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me? Verse 21, Has not the potter power over the clay, over the same lump, to make one vessel unto honor, and another one to dishonor? And look what he says. He quotes from Isaiah in verse 21. Or excuse me, verse 26 we'll start. Actually, we'll start in verse 25. Excuse me, I don't want to get ahead of myself. But in verse 25, he quotes from Hosea. Another Old Testament prophet. Verse 25, And he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which were not beloved. He's talking about the Gentiles here, but they were mentioned in the Old Testament. In verse 26, And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, they shall be called the children of the living God. And the living God is something that is taught in the doctrine for the body of Christ from Romans to Philemon. You can read about that. Paul talks about that. Then in verse 27, he goes on to quote from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah cried concerning Israel, not the body of Christ. Pay attention to what it says, where it says it, to whom it says it. It's, this is after the cross being quoted, but be careful, it's not doctrine for the body of Christ. He says, though the number of the children of Israel be as sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Verse 28, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Verse 29, and as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of the Sabbath had left us a seed, 
We had been as Sodom and been made unto like Gomorrah. These are Old Testament prophecies. These are Old Testament stories. These are Old Testament history of the nation of Israel. In verse 33, he finishes by saying, As it is written, Behold, I lay a Zion, a stumbling stone, and a rock of offense, and whosoever shall believe on him shall not be ashamed. You see, the rock of offense, the stumbling block, was something for the nation of Israel exclusively because they were a physical entity. They require a sign. 1 Corinthians chapter, 20, chapter 1, verse 22, and the Greek seek after wisdom. It's all in the same verse, but that's where the stumbling block of the stone of offense belongs to the nation of Israel in the times past. Very interesting. And then we get to chapter 10. Lo and behold, it shifts gears again. Because he says in verse 1, he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He still is after Israel to be saved. Then he says in verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Ah, something else is coming in here. He's giving a little inkling to bring us back into what the central theme of the book of Romans is, the but now of the cross, faith. For he says in verse 6, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or in verse 7, or who shall descend unto the deep, that is to bring Christ again from the dead. Verse 8, but what saith it? The word is nigh, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, and that is the word of faith, which we preach. Doesn't fit verse 9 at all, does it? Verse 9 says, I mean, excuse me, chapter 9. Verse 9 says, that if thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe with thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. All of a sudden, we're talking about the gospel here. We're talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, believing only by faith. Now, in the midst of these three chapters that are talking predominantly about Israel, he just doesn't want you to lose the focus, that it's changed. There is a division here. There is the ages, the times past, which was verse 9. We're in the but now of the cross, chapter 10. Things change. It went on to Faith. And look what he says in verse 12. Or verse 11, he says, And for the scripture saith, Whoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Verse 12, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord is over all, is rich unto them that call upon him. Verse 13, For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And what does it say in verse 17? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's chapter 10. Completely different than chapter 9, starting to fit a little bit more into the realm of the central theme of the book of Romans, but really fits into the theme with the rest of the books about faith and faith alone for our salvation. Even there's no difference between Jew and Greek, bond or free, male or female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. That is even further on in the Galatians. Now we come to chapter 11. What does he say? He said, again, in verse 3, he said, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone and seek my life. He's talking about Elijah here again when he prayed to God to save him because he was the only one left. And God said to him, Verse 4, but what thou sayest, the answer of God unto him, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. In verse 5, even so then at this present time there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Verse 7, he says, but what then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election has obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Look what he says in verse 11. He says, I say, had they stumbled that they should fall, God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Now verse 12, now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more in their fullness? 
Then he goes on to talk about it, warning the Gentiles to be not high-minded and cocky like the Israelites were in the times past. Let it go into your head that you have something special here. You have to be careful. And you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Because he says in verse 25, this is the restoration of Israel coming now all of a sudden. After the cross, after we're caught up, the age of grace is done. The great tribulation, the millennial rule of Jesus Christ on into eternity. Verse 25, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. The blindness is part happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. That's where we get at the end of the age of grace. And verse 26 says, so that all of Israel shall be saved. This is Revelation talking. This is prophecy from the Old Testament talking about the restoration, the saving of Israel as a nation in the ages to come at the cross. For he says, for all of Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Verse 27, for this is my covenant unto them, I shall take away their sins. Verse 28, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved of the Father's sake. Who are the Father's sake? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Again, Old Testament economy. Again, gospel of the kingdom message for the restoration of Israel. It's very easy to see if you read slowly and carefully with the premise of dissecting the Word of God as he commands us to do in 2 Timothy. It will all make sense to get through chapters 9, 10, and 11 without losing focus on the general theme of the book of Romans. Because you can become very confused saying there's contraindications here because chapter 10 talks about faith. Chapter 9 doesn't talk about faith at all. It talks about the works, talks about the law, talks about Israel in times past. And verse 11 talks about Israel in the future. What's going on? Why is it there? It's there to prepare us. It is there for our learning. Because Paul says, continuing on in the book of Romans, in chapter 15, he says, in verse 4, chapter 15, he says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we may through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And then he says something very astounding in verse 8 that backs up what was written in verses nine, on chapters 9, 10, and 11. Especially 9 and 11. He says in verse 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, the promises that were made in the Old Testament in the times past. And then he says something about himself. He says in verse 16 that I, Paul, should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Not the minister of the truth of God, but a minister of Jesus Christ. And he says, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles may be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. When you look again at the divisions of the cross, putting them in perspective now with the times past, of Romans chapter 9, jumping to uh, chapter 10, where it turns into faith, by faith alone. And then you have the restoration of Israel in the ages to come. Verse 11. It's a quick synopsis, a prelude, as to what was gone in the past, what we are in now, the but now of the cross, and what is coming in the ages to come. He lightly touches on it, but it's there, and it's unmistakably there. And when you look at it from rightly dividing the word of truth and the division of the cross, it makes total sense. Because right there is the perfect illustration of the division of the cross that has been there since the conception of the canonized scripture of the Bible. But I've never heard it taught. I've never heard people teach other than going through the books First by verse, chapter to chapter, book by book, and whatever. Not looking and saying, why is it different when we get to chapters 9, 10, and 11? Why is it different? What is the purpose of it? 
You have to ask God these questions in order to find out the answers. And it's very plain. Why 9, 10, and 11 are there, why they were written, who they were written to, and who they were written for. Once you have that understanding, you're not going to be confused. You're going to carry that on through the rest of the revelation of the mystery of Jesus Christ, which was absolutely revealed. And what he accomplished at the cross, not only all the way through the books of the Romans through Philemon and the 13 books of the doctrine for the body of Christ, but right here in the middle of the book of Romans, chapters 9, 10, and 11. It's not easy, it takes work, it takes prayer, but the payoff is incredible. To understand scripture, to understand why it's laid out like it is, there's no mistake in God's word and how God has it laid out for us. We're the ones that make it into confusion. We're the ones that make it into mistakes because we try to look at it from our perspective, not God's. I don't have time to give you the gospel of our salvation, which is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. But please read it and believe it by faith and faith alone. And you will come to appreciate the parasynthetical verse chapters of Romans 9, 10, and 11. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. A Bible study. From my home to your home. This is Robert Holler thanking you. And hey, once again, until next time.